This is the second lecture of week one. In this lecture, we will talk about the nervous system and nerve conduction. So the first place to start with a study of the nervous system is to go down to the cellular level. And there's two main types of cells in the central in the nervous system. Neuroglial cells, which are located in the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system, and neurons. This is a very nice picture of a neuron. And you can see it's got a big cell body with a nucleus in the middle, all of those organelles in there that you can probably recognize, Golgi apparatus, mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum, all of those organelles are in neurons in the cell body. And then you can see all these branches coming off. All the branches you see except the big one down at the bottom are dendrites. The big one down at the bottom is the axon. All neurons have one axon, and they may have zero to many dendrites, but they all have just one axon. And we're going to talk about all that in the, in the subsequent slides. So let's talk about the different components of the neuron, the soma, the body. The key, it has, like I said, all of the organelles are in the, in the cell body just like any other cell, muscle cell, etc. The key with that, though, is the in the body of the neuron is the site of the neurotransmitter and neuromodulator precursor production. So any neurotransmitter that that neuron is going to release is usually made in the cell body. So it has to be transmitted down the axon to get released, but it's made or at least the precursor of it's made in the cell body. That leads us to the axon. There's only one axon per neuron. The axon is very important because that's where the release of the neuromodulator or the neurotransmitter is going to occur down at its synaptic terminal at the end. So what you see is the one axons, you see those two segments there, those are Schwann cells myelinating that axon. And then the axon at the end splits off to many branches. And each one of those branches can release the neurotransmitter that was made up there in the cell body. So what would happen if you injured this axon and disrupted the integrity of that axon? What effect would that have on neurotransmitter release? The axon's also the location of the action potential that occurs in a neuron. We're going to talk a lot about that in subsequent slides. But the axon, right where that arrow is pointed, the very beginning of the axon, right where it comes off the cell body, is called the axon hillock. And in that axon hillock are a lot of voltage-gated sodium channels. So just keep that in mind as we talk about that later on. Axons, as you can see, can be either myelinated or unmyelinated. This one is myelinated. You see one, two, three, four segments. That would be four individual Schwann cells myelinating that axon. And then you can see down at the bottom in this one, there's three terminals there. That's where the neurotransmitter will be released. So we've talked about the cell body. We've talked about the axon. Now let's talk about the dendrites. Dendrites means branching. Or for Greek, it's a tree. The most important part of the dendrite is that it's the major receptive area of a neuron. All of those little branches have receptors on them, just waiting for a neurotransmitter to bind to it and have some effect on the neuron. 
With age, you get pruning of dendrites. So in other words, with age, neurons start losing some of their dendrites. If they start losing some of those dendrites, they lose the receptive capabilities of that neuron. Therefore, that neuron doesn't get stimulated as easily because neurotransmitters can't find receptors as well because there's fewer branches. Inside the neuron, mostly in the cell body, but also down the axons and some in the dendrites, you have filaments throughout the whole neuron. It, it helps add structure and support to the neuron, plus it transports substances around the neuron. There's usually three types of this neuronal cytoskeleton running through a neuron. Microtubules, neurofilaments, and microfilaments. Microtubules are long, a long filament composed mostly of a protein called tau. In Alzheimer's disease, that protein is abnormally phosphorylated, causes disruption of, of the microtubules in neurons of Alzheimer's, and that one of the reasons you have cell death and Alzheimer's disease. In addition, if you look at neurofilaments, which typically provide structural support, they tend to cluster and clump up and kill neurons in Alzheimer's disease as well. So I indicated that substances like neurotransmitters have to go from the cell body to get down to those nerve terminals. And it does it by going, being carried down through the axon. And the speed with which that occurs can vary. There's fast anterograde transport, okay? And there's slow anterograde transport. The fast transport is the neurotransmitters and neuromodulators being transmitted down. So when it... A substance goes from the cell body to the terminal. It's called anterograde transport. But substances can enter the central, the nervous system into, from the outside into the synaptic terminal and go up the axon into the cell body. That's called retrograde transport. And that's important because that's how nerve growth factors are taken up from the terminal through the axon into the cell body, but that's also how viruses like polio, tetanus, rabies virus can get into the nervous system through the terminal, go up the axon into the cell body and can destroy the nerve. With aging and certain diseases like Alzheimer, transport down that axon eventually slows. So if it's slower transport with aging, that means it takes longer for the neurotransmitter to be released, which is part of the slow movements of older people because the muscles aren't being stimulated as quickly to contract. This slide indicates the structural classification of neurons. So neurons are classified by their structure as either unipolar, bipolar, or multipolar neurons. And these are all shown on the very next slide as for pictures of these. But right now, I'll just explain them. Unipolar, uni meaning one, or pseudo-unipolar, like your textbook indicates have only one projection extending off the cell body. That one projection is considered an axon. Mo this is important. Most of your peripheral sensory neurons are unipolar neurons. So when you touch the tip of your finger, that information is being transmitted into the spinal cord by a unipolar neuron. Bipolar, 
as you might expect, you have the cell body, you have one dendrite coming off at one end of the cell body, and then again, one axon on the other side of the cell body. Those aren't as, as numerous in the nervous system. They're only found really in the retina, vestibular nerve, and the cochlear nerve have bipolar neurons as well as the olfactory neurons do. So they're not as plentiful. The most plentiful structural type of neuron in the nervous system are your multipolar. Again, one axon and two or more dendrites, usually quite a few dendrites coming off the cell body. Most of your motor neurons are multipolar and most of your central nervous system inner neurons are multipolar. Very important to know that your motor nerves are multipolar neurons. Again, all of this is shown on the next slide. So the first one we talked about was the unipolar. That's the one on your right. You see the cell body and you see one projection off of that. That one projection does split into two. But that one projection is considered an axon. That's your sensor, peripheral sensory neurons or that structure of a neuron. The middle one's the bipolar, dendrite at one end, axon in the other. And then finally on the left is your multipolar, your typical motor neuron and inner neurons. There you see the cell body, you see the one big axon coming off of the bottom, and then you see many, many dendrites extending off of that cell body. All three of those types of neurons, class, structural classification, have one thing in common, and you need to be able to know what that one thing is. They all have one thing in common. Let's start with the neural glial cells, the central nervous system neural glial cells, because in reality, when you think of the cells of the nervous system, most people just think of neurons. But neural glial cells are like 10 times more numerous than the neurons. And they perform a lot more, a lot more individual functions than neurons do. So <clears throat> Neuroglio, neuro, neuron, glio means glue, because it used to be thought that that's what the neuroglial cells did. They were just cells in between the neurons and kind of held them together. But now they know there's a lot more going on with these neuroglial cells, and there's a lot of different types of neuroglial cells. So the main neuroglial cells are astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglial, and ependymal cells. Astrocytes, with astro, star-like cells, they do add structure. They're part of the blood-brain barrier. That's what BBB means. They're part of the blood-brain barrier. They also perform some physiological functions, like they maintain potassium levels. They're able to guide migrating neurons to get reconnection of neurons. The bad thing about astrocytes, though, is one of them is they can scar in the central nervous system. And that scarring in the central nervous system can stop one neuron from reconnecting to another neuron. So that's one of the reasons in a spinal cord injured patient, nerves can't regrow, reconnect, and then the person has normal function because there's a lot of scarring going on where the injury was and those neurons can't reconnect. And the astrocytes are a part of that problem. They also can form tumors, astrocytomas. Another physiological function of astrocytes is they can transmit information. They can transmit calcium to other astrocytes, and they can communicate in a two-way fashion with neurons. Another neuroglial cell is oligodendrocytes. The oligodendrocytes myelinate axons in the central nervous system. They put that myelinated cushion or insulation around neurons, which we'll talk about shortly. 
they myelinate the neurons in the central nervous system. So in MS, multiple sclerosis, one of the problems with multiple sclerosis is the body's generating antibodies that attack your own oligodendrocytes. And if they do that, and they destroy the oligodendrocytes, then the central nervous system axons don't get myelinated, and that creates a lot of the problems that you see in multiple sclerosis. Again, we talk about that later on. Microglial cells are phagocytes. Phagocytes are cells that eat tissue. They also can release growth factors to help axonal regeneration. But for some reason, in some cases of Alzheimer's and in AIDS, the microglial cells get overactivated and then they start eating away normal tissue like normal neurons, causing some neuronal loss in those diseases. And then another neuroglial cell is ependymal cells. And what they do is they line the inside of the ventricles and the central canal through the spinal cord. We'll talk about that later as well. This slide is showing how astrocytes are part of the blood-brain barrier. What you see is a, a, at the top is a blood vessel. What you see at the bottom is a neuron. In between is the star-like astrocyte, functioning in this case as part of the blood-brain barrier. What that means is normally, the blood is not in direct contact with a neuron. And you really wouldn't want the neurons usually to be in direct contact with substances in the blood because some of the substances in the blood would be toxic to it. So you want them to be separated from the blood and the astrocytes do that and you can see the fashion here they're kind of in between the neuron and the blood vessel this slide shows how the astrocytes communicate with neurons and you can see the connections in the illustration there there's basically two types of astrocytes protoplasmic astrocytes located in the gray matter of the nervous system they're the ones that can form astrocytomas. And fibrous astrocytes are astrocytes located in, within tracts of the ner nervous system. Those are the ones that could form scar tissue and block reconnection of damaged neurons. As indicated in the previous slide on the list of the different types of uh, neuroglial cells, ependymocytes are one as well. And like I said before, they line the inside of the ventricles and the central canal. They can form tumors called ependymomas within the brain. There's also choroidal, ependymal cells also have the choroidal epithelial cells. Those are the ones that produce, your, your, produce and secrete cerebral spinal fluid. So there's two types of ependymal cells, ependymocytes and choroidal epithelial cells. This form gives you a summary of the glial cells in the central nervous system about their principal location and uh, principal functions. So the previous slide indicated the types of neuroglial cells in the central nervous system. This slide is indicating the type of neuroglial cells that are in the peripheral nervous system outside of the vertebral canal in the uh, cranium. The main one is the Schwann cells. The Schwann cells myelinate axons in the peripheral nervous system. So in Guillain-Barre, which we'll talk about shortly, the bo your body generates antibodies that attack those Schwann cells. Therefore, myelination does not occur or the myelination that's already occurred gets destroyed and that creates a lot of the signs and symptoms that you see in Guillain-Barre. So oligodendrocytes myelinate neurons in the central nervous system, Schwann cells myelinate neurons in the peripheral nervous system. And one final uh, peripheral nervous system neuroglial cells, the dorsal root ganglia satellite cells. 
in that dorsal root ganglia, there's neuroglial cells. They call them satellite cells. They cover the cell bodies of the peripheral sensory neurons of both the peripheral and autonomic nervous system. And they add structure to the ganglia and provide nutrients to those neurons. So there's not a whole lot said about those. So it's kind of more of a minor neuroglial cell compared to the Schwann cells, but they do exist. This slide is illustrating Schwann cells and oligodendrocytes. You can see the Schwann cell at the top, which myelinates axons in the peripheral nervous system. Each one of those segments are Schwann cells providing the wrap around insulation around the axon, the myelin. Whereas the oligodendrocytes, you can see one oligodendrocyte can myelinate a number of segments of axons of a number of neurons. So oligodendrocytes can myelinate multiple axons. Schwann cells only myelinate one segment of an axon. So if you have 10 segments on an axon, you have 10 Schwann cells, each one producing one of those segments of myelin. This is a summary for the function of myelin. Myelin is an isolating layer and uh, it forms a sheath around the nerve. It is created uh, by oligodendral size in central nervous system and uh, in peripheral nervous system, the Schwann cells form that. This uh, myelin sheath allow the uh, electrical impulse to trans uh, transmit quickly and efficiently along the nerve cells. It is very critical to conduction in the nervous system. Actually, the myelin sheath is not continuously in peripheral nervous system. You can see from this picture, um, one Schwann cells only myelinate um, a small part of the long axons. There is a gap between two Schwann cells. Uh, we call this gap its node of Ranvier. It is a periodic gap in the isolating sheath. It is about one microliter wide and uh, exposes in this part the exposed uh, the uh, neural membrane to the external environment. So area of uh, myelin between the node of Ranvier, we call it internode. So one Schwann cells myelinate one internode around the axons. This, uh, this node of Ranvier uh, serves to facilitate the rapid conduction of the nerve impulses. Myelin is very important for the conduction of nerve cells, but in some situation, these myelin sheaths could be damaged by, for some reason, like autoimmune disease happened in uh, central nervous system, for example, the MS. And uh, it could also happen in peripheral nervous system, like Guillain-Barré syndrome. Uh, in these conditions, uh, it could happen this demyelination. That means uh, the myelin sheath has been injured. It could affect the conduction of the nervous nerve cell. So these red letters just uh, provide you some information uh, that to, can help you understand this disease.
So we've talked about the cell body, we've talked about the axon, we've talked about the dendrites, but you have to realize, of course, that all of those structures are covered with a membrane, like all other cells are. And the membrane is very similar to other membranes that buy a phospholipid layer. And in, tucked in every so often along that membrane and that phospholipid bilayer are proteins in the membranes of these neurons. There are channel proteins, pump proteins like sodium, potassium, ATPase, and calcium pump, and receptor proteins. And we're going to talk about all those in subsequent slides. So to understand how neurons function, how they release neurotransmitters and have an effect on another neuron or uh, at the neuromuscular junction and cause a muscle to contract, you have to understand the physiology that occurs in a neuron for it to do its function. First place to start with that is what's called the resting membrane potential. Neurons in general have a resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. And that means that inside the neuron compared to the outside of the neuron, it's a negative 70 millivolt charge. And it's kept that way. That's when it's at rest, when it's not being stimulated or when it's not being inhibited, it's just being at rest. It's negative 70 millivolts inside versus outside. So it's polarized. Polarized means it's on the uh, there's uh, there's contrast on one side of the membrane to the other. Now, how does it stay at negative 70 when it's not being stimulated and inhibited? It does it by these three ways. Number one, there are non-gated leak channels, passive channels that allow ions to go into the neuron or ions to come out of the neuron. We're going to talk about all that. There's a pump, a, an active sodium potassium ATPase pump. Requires ATP, requires energy to pump three sodiums in and two potassiums out. And there are negatively charged intracellular proteins and ions inside the neuron. So if you've got all these trapped proteins and ions that are already negatively charged, obviously that's going to contribute to the negative charge inside the neuron. So let's talk about these leak channels, these leak proteins in the membrane. They are selectively permeable to sodium which is positively charged, potassium positively charged, chloride negatively charged. Based on their size and their charge, certain proteins have a channel that will allow sodium in but not potassium or potassium through and but not sodium. So it depends on their charge and their size. So some of the factors affecting ion movement through the channels is the concentration gradient, the difference of concentration of one of those ions outside versus inside. And what you see is the concentration of sodium, positively charged sodium outside is greater than the sodium inside. So which way is sodium going to go? It's going to go from outside into the neuron, dragging a positive charge in there. Negatively charged chloride is in greater concentration outside than it is inside. So negatively charged chloride will just passively go into the neuron creating, helping to increase the negative charge in the neuron. And then positively charged potassium is in greater concentration inside the neuron than outside. So positively charged potassium wants to flow out of the neuron. So if positively charged goes out of the neuron, what happens on the inside? It's more negative. So that's the passive way of ions moving positive versus negatively charged. That has part of the effect on creating this negative 70 millivolt charge inside the neuron. Another key way that the negative 70 millivolt resting membrane potential is maintained is the sodium potassium ATPase pump. It's a pump. 
that can drive the positively charged sodium out, three of those out, and will drive two positively charged potassiums in. So you still have a net negative charge. If you take three out and only put two positive in, you get a net negative net charge going created inside the neuron. They are constantly active, but they require energy, ATP, to do that. So this slide sums it up for you, and it's a very important slide to know. That resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts inside the neuron is maintained passively by those concentration differences, sodium being greater outside than inside, chloride being greater outside than inside, potassium being greater inside versus outside. Another way is the active ATP sodium potassium pump and then negatively charged ions and proteins that are already trapped inside the neuron. So those three ways are how the resting membrane potential stays at about negative 70 millivolts. It's those three ways. So now we know how the resting membrane potential is maintained at negative 70. What happens when that resting membrane potential is disrupted? It can be disrupted either by being depolarized. Remember, it was at rest, it's polarized. It's negative 70 inside, it's zero really outside. It's polarized. But that resting membrane potential can be disrupted either by being depolarized or hyperpolarized. Depolarization, also known as an EPSP or excitatory postsynaptic potential, is when the resting membrane potential becomes more positive. So it goes from negative 70 maybe down to negative 60 or negative 50. Hyperpolarization means that negative 70 millivolts becomes more negative. Now it goes from negative 70 to maybe negative 80. And that's created, that's called an IPSP or inhibitory postsynaptic potential. Now if we go back to depolarization, which is making that more positive inside, if that resting membrane potential becomes more positive and gets down to about negative 55 millivolts, that's going to result in the generation of an action potential which is what we'll talk about shortly. So whether a neuron generates an action potential or does not is dependent on the net amount of EPSPs versus IPSPs that are encroaching onto that particular neuron. So you see in your diagram there's one neuron in the middle and you see multiple neurons synapsing on it. Some of them are going to stimulate that neuron, make it make the resting membrane potential get closer to negative 55. Other neurons are inhibiting that neuron. They're causing the resting membrane potential to get further from negative 55. Go from negative 70 to negative 80, for example. So it depends. It's a net effect. If there's more EPSPs than IPSPs, an action potential will generate. If there's more IPSPs than EPSPs, synapsing on the neuron, then the neuron will not generate an action potential and release its neurotransmitter. So it's a net effect. So what happens if enough neurotransmitters bind to some of those receptors and allow enough sodium to go into the neuron, again, the resting membrane potential will drop from negative 70 down to negative 55. And now in this case, what happens is voltage-gated sodium channels located in the axon hillock, which I've indicated with the arrow in that diagram on the right, that little stub of axon right outside the cell body just off of the cell body, the very beginning of the axon there, 
is filled with sodium, uh, voltage-gated sodium channels. So when the resting membrane potential goes from negative 70 to negative 55, those channels open, allow an influx of, of sodium to enter that causes the action potential, which then runs down the axon and releases the neurotransmitter that you see at the bottom of that diagram. So you, at the top, you see the generator potential by a receptor allowing sodium to go in when it's stimulated, causing opening of voltage-gated uh, sodium channels in the trigger zone right next to the proscenium corpuscle. Action potential release the neurotransmitter. And then at the bottom, you see an EPSP. The, the top one's a generated potential. The bottom one's an EPSP, where the dendrites and their receptors are stimulated by neurotransmitters binding to them, causes the resting membrane potential to drop to negative 55, and then voltage-gated sodium channels enter at the axon hillock, indicated by the arrow, causing an action potential and the neurotransmitter release. So let's talk a little bit more about action potential conduction. Once those voltage-gated sodium channels open and allow this influx of calcium to occur inside the neuron, an action potential is generated. And the speed of conduction of that action potential down an axon is dependent on a couple of things. One of them is the diameter of the axon. The larger diameter, the wider the diameter of an axon, the faster the action potential will generate down the axon and allow a neurotransmitter to be released at its synaptic terminal. So the diameter of the axon has an effect on the conduction, as well as whether the axon is myelinated or not. Myelination speeds the, the conduction of an action potential down an axon. So a myelinated axon, the action potential doesn't have to go up and down all the way through the membrane. It only goes at little spots in between the segments, which you'll see in uh, subsequent slides. So the conduction through an axon is faster when an axon is myelinated. So this slide shows a myelinated axon, and you can see the one in the middle, you can see there's three segments of myelin. Remember, each one of those segments is one Schwann cell that's myelinated that segment of the axon. So the myelin acts as an insulator. So as the action potential is traveling down through the axon, it jumps from one, the areas in between the segments are called nodes of Ron VA. The action potential only occurs at those nodes of Ron VA. So it kind of jumps. That's what saltatory conduction means. Saltaire means to jump. So the action potential doesn't have to travel all the way along the membrane, only at those nodes of Ron VA. So that speeds the conduction down the axon. So, so far we've talked about some of the major parts of a neuron. We talked about the cell body. We talked about the dendrites. We talked about the axon. Now we're talking about the termination of that axon. The axon terminates into what's called a synapse. If you look at the structure of the synapse, that's what this slide shows. The membrane of that synapse, of that terminus, is called the presynaptic membrane. Then you have a gap called the synaptic cleft. And then you have either a muscle cell membrane or another neuron membrane, could be a dendrite with receptors there, is the postsynaptic membrane. So the whole, the presynaptic membrane, the synaptic cleft, and the postsynaptic membrane make up the synapse. And it's here where the neurotransmitter is released 
and it's here where the neurotransmitter will bind to a receptor on the postsynaptic membrane of either a muscle cell, if it's a neuromuscular junction, or on a receptor of another neuron. There are different types of synapses based off of where they synapse onto. So for example, there are axodendritic synapses. In other words, an axon synapses on a postsynaptic membrane, which, which is a dendrite with a receptor. That's your axodendritic synapse. That's the most numerous in the um, nervous system, and they're usually excitatory. Then there's axosomatic, where the axon synapses on a, the soma or the body of another neuron. Oftentimes those are inhibitory. Then there's axoaxonic, where an axon synapses on another axon. And what you see down at the bottom, that's a presynaptic inhibition can occur there, or presynaptic facilitation. So in other words, when that axon releases its neurotransmitter and it binds on a receptor to a terminus, that's your axoaxonic, it may either facilitate the release of the neurotransmitter from that second neuron, or it might inhibit that neuron from being able to release its neurotransmitter. Now, so far I've mentioned mostly a neuron synapsing on another neuron. The other type of synapse that occurs is a neuron synapsing on a muscle cell. There's your, there's your neuromuscular junction. So the axon synapses on a muscle cell membrane that has the receptors. In this case, the axon releases acetylcholine. It binds to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane of a muscle cell, and that stimulates the muscle cell to contract. So we keep talking about an action potential being generated and traveling down along an axon. What is its function? The function of that action potential is, allow, is to allow release of a neurotransmitter down at the terminal. So what happens is when the action potential goes down the axon, gets down to the terminal, it causes voltage-gated calcium channels to open up in the terminal. Calcium goes into the terminal, and when it does that, it causes vesicles that contain the neurotransmitter for that neuron to go down to the membrane and open up and release the neurotransmitter. So the action potential causes opening of voltage-gated calcium channels in the, in the terminus membrane. And when calcium then enters into that terminus, it causes the vesicles to release the neurotransmitter. So just to review again, neurotransmitters or neuromodulators, which I'll explain here in a moment, bind to receptors either on muscle cell membranes, that's the neuromuscular junction, or they release these neurotransmitters and bind to receptors on neurons. Usually those receptors on dendrites, sometimes they're on the body of a neuron. A term now that's kind of used to describe neurotransmitters and neuromodulators are neuromessengers. Uh, the difference between a neurotransmitter and a neuromodulator is neurotransmitters have a very short-term, quick effect and are released right at the synapses. Neuromodulators have a more long-term effect. So when they bind to a neuron, for example, its effect is more long-term. It's not a quick, immediate response. This slide shows that neurotransmitters like glutamate are released right in the synaptic gap. Neuromodulators like substance P are released off of the axon, but not in the synaptic gap. So it takes a little bit longer for those neuromodulators to find a receptor to bind to.
So what you have listed here is a number of different types, common neurotransmitters. Glutamate, it's the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Is that important? Yes, it is. So the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system is glutamate. So what would glutamate cause? An EPSP or an IPSP? GABA is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. It inhibits the neuron, and it does it by a couple ways. It either can increase chloride influx into the neuron, or it can increase potassium efflux out of the neuron. That's what baclofen does. Baclofen is a drug given to a person that has spasticity. The muscles in high tone. You want to inhibit that muscle. One way of doing it is giving it baclofen. It'll inhibit the neuron at the neuromuscular junction. That neuron will not release as much acetylcholine, therefore the muscles won't contract as much and the muscle can relax more. Uh, Valium okay, binds to GABA receptors and potentiates GABA's effect. So it's an anti-anxiety. It, it reduces nerve uh, the nervous activity in the body by reducing neurotransmission it kind of slows down neurotransmission and blocks it another neurotransmitter is norepinephrine released from postganglionic sympathetics this neurotransmitter like others can either be inhibitory or can be excitatory it depends on the receptor it binds to dopamine involved in motor control Parkinson's disease, serotonin produced by neurons in the brainstem. Low levels of serotonin are seen in depression, anxiety, and obsessive compulsive disorder. So the types of drugs you give people with those disorders are Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft. They keep more serotonin in the synaptic gap so that it can bind a receptor. So in other words, those drugs try to raise the level of serotonin so you can reduce the symptoms associated with those disorders. Another key neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. In the peripheral nervous system, it causes the muscle contraction. That's what's released at the neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine binds the receptors, causes the muscle to contract. Botox can decrease spasticity by impairing the vesicles with acetylcholine from fuse. It stops acetylcholine from being released. The muscle cells can't contract, and the muscle cells relax. That's what Botox does. Acetylcholine is obviously released in the autonomic nervous system, and we talk about that a lot when we get to that. And acetylcholine is also released in the central nervous system. At the base of the cortex, there's neurons that release it, and we find in Alzheimer's disease... And even in Parkinson's disease, neurons that release acetylcholine are reduced in those two diseases. Substance P, the pain messenger, released from sensory neurons transmitting pain. Endorphins and encephalons inhibit neurons in the perception of pain. That's why you get that rush, that good feeling from those. Even if it's painful, it's less painful because your perception of pain is reduced because of those two uh, neurotransmitters. And glycine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter found uh, mostly in the spinal cord. So we've talked about all the different types of neurotransmitters and neuromodulators, and we, I indicated that they bind to receptors. So let's talk about these receptors that they bind to. There's a, three different types in general. One of them are called ligand-gated channels or receptors. And that's what you see on the right, the upper part where the arrow is pointing to. In this case, the neurotransmitter binds to that receptor, and that receptor opens up, forms a channel, and allows the ions to go in. So it's a quick response, a rapid short-term effect. Those are ligand-gated or ionotropic receptors. There are two other types, 
They're called G-protein gated ion channel and a G-protein gated second messenger complex that we'll talk about. The G-protein gated ion channel is illustrated in this slide. So you can see in the top left, a neurotransmitter binds to a receptor. That receptor has a complex bound to it, a G-protein complex. When that neurotransmitter binds to that receptor, you can follow it over to B. What happens is GDP is replaced by GTP. And if you look at C, that subunit, one of the subunits of that G-protein complex then comes off and it goes down the membrane to bind to a channel. Binding of that channel causes that channel to open up and allow an ion to pass through it. So that's your G-protein gated ion channel. So it's a slower process. The neurotransmitter binds a receptor and then that subunit of that G-protein has to come off, go down to a, a receptor downstream of the membrane, bind to it, opens that up, and now an ion can go into that cell. The other type of G-protein receptor is a G-protein second messenger. It's similar to the previous one. The neurotransmitter binds to the receptor. One segment of that G-protein complex comes off, goes downstream, and binds to, in this case, an enzyme. For example, adenylate cyclase enzyme. Activates that enzyme, and activation of that enzyme causes a cascade of metabolic processes to occur in the in the cell. So obviously this is a very long-term effect when that neurotransmitter binds onto a G-protein second messenger. Now, we're going to talk about some diseases that occur at the synapse. In this case, there's two key diseases that occur at the neuromuscular junction. So let's review the neuromuscular junction again first. You have a presynaptic membrane, which is the membrane of the, terminal, of the terminus of a neuron. You have a synaptic gap, and you have a postsynaptic membrane, which in this case is a muscle cell membrane that's filled with acetylcholine receptors. So at the neuromuscular junction, acetylcholine is released by the neuron, it crosses the synaptic gap, it binds to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane of the muscle cell, and that binding is going to cause that muscle cell to contract. So myasthenia gravis, gravis means severe or grave, maya means muscle, asthenia means weakness, so it's grave muscle weakness in myasthenia gravis. Again, it's, it's an autoimmune disease. Your body's producing antibodies that are binding to the acetylcholine receptors and blocking them so that acetylcholine is released, but it can't bind on a receptor. If it can't bind on a receptor, the muscle cell doesn't contract. If muscle cells don't contract, you one of the symptoms is weakness. And the weakness that you see the most with this disease are muscles that have to contract frequently, such as your eyelid muscles, your eye muscles themselves, respiratory muscles, muscles involved in swallowing, and also proximal limb muscles. So muscles that have to contract repetitively are going to be more affected by this disease. Symptoms become worse with exercise, right? Because exercise is demanding the muscles to contract and they can't contract. So the more you try to, the weaker you get. So one way that they can diagnose this is they can give an anticholinesterase drug. Now what do they mean by that? When acetylcholine is released from that nerve terminal, it crosses the synaptic gap, and if it can find an acetylcholine receptor, it binds to it. If it can't find one, 
Then there's an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase located in the synaptic gap that will metabolize and basically remove acetylcholine. So acetylcholine has to find that receptor in some finite time. If it doesn't, then this enzyme is going to remove it. So one way they can diagnose this disease, myasthenia gravis, is called the Tensilon test. Okay. They give a drug, endrophonium or Tensilon, which is an anti-cholinesterase drug. In other words, it's a drug that binds to and stops the enzyme cholin acetylcholinesterase from working. So if, if you can block acetylcholinesterase from working, then when acetylcholine is released, it's got more time to try to find a receptor. And eventually it'll find a receptor. And therefore the symptoms will improve because muscle cells can contract because you're blocking the removal of acetylcholine. So that's one way they know it's myasthenia gravis. The second disease of the neuromuscular junction is the Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome, or LEMS. This disease is very similar symptoms to myasthenia gravis, but it is associated more with cancer of the lung. It's thought that the cancer cells express a voltage-gated calcium channel that the body sees as foreign and produces antibodies against voltage-gated calcium channels. It results in, again, the loss of calcium going up into the terminus and, and decrease acetylcholine release. Uh, motor neurons are affected. Muscle weakness, you have proximal limb muscle, just like myasthenia gravis. But you do have some more autonomic um, nervous system dysfunctions like dry mouth, constipation, reduced sweating, orthostatic hypertension. You wouldn't have that as much in myasthenia gravis. How would you treat this? If it is cancer, obviously they're treating for cancer. Or then give gu guanidine or uh, calcium gluconate, which facilitates acetylcholine release. And again, plasmapheresis is trying to filter out those autoantibodies. Unlike myasthenia gravis, the symptoms may actually improve with exercise because it's not somehow exercise. In Eaton-Lambert syndrome, the problem is that, that acetylcholine is not released. Myasthenia gravis, acetylcholine is released, but it can't bind to a receptor. Eaton-Lambert syndrome, acetylcholine is not released because the autoantibodies that are generated are blocking the calcium, voltage-gated calcium channels at the terminus. Therefore, acetylcholine never gets released. So one way they can distinguish whether this, what this person has is myasthenia gravis or Lambert-Eaton is to give them that Tensilon test. If they give the Tensilon test, which is an anti-cholinesterase drug that binds to the, and stops the enzyme removing acetylcholine, then symptoms improve with myasthenia gravis, but they won't improve in Eaton-Lambert syndrome. The reason for that is because acetylcholine is never released into the synaptic gap for acetylcholinesterase to work on it. So it's not released at all. So that drug does not improve the symptoms on Eaton-Lambert, but it does in myasthenia gravis.